having been so long uh, familiar with the tree areas that it's sold in, and if I would be, and, uh, could be Chicago or Los Angeles or Detroit or pretty near anywhere, I suppose I would just look for a certain neighborhood, an area of that neighborhood. You can feel it when you're there. That was a drug addict talking. This is one of the neighborhoods he was talking about. In a moment, we will watch an addict attempt to buy heroin here. If he needs, he will be arrested for we are watching together with the police. Base unit to auto. Base unit to auto. Over. Base unit, go ahead. To remain on scene, we'll tell you when activity picks up. Over. We'll do. We'll do. Over. Be available for a quick movement. Over and out. This is a drug addict on his way to make a purchase of heroin. Without his knowledge, he's under police observation from a nearby truck. Base unit to auto. Base unit to auto. Over. Auto to base unit. Go ahead. There is a subject on the scene now. His description is as follows. He's male, white, about five foot six, approximately 150 pounds. He is fairly thin in his bill. He is wearing a brownish jacket, a light pair of trousers, a gray hat, straw hat, Turn down all the way around. Do you read me? Over. Do not leave your location as yet. Be in readiness. Do not leave your location as yet. The conversation is still going on between the two. Tell you when they leave. Over. Here the action. The action is starting. That's it. He's picked up a cat. Base unit to auto. The subjects have split. Subjects have split. All right, Otto, slowly start to cruise up the block. He is going to turn. He is going to turn east on Yale Street. All right, come up, Otto. Come up, Otto, and come. Let's go, Otto. Let's go. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Let's go, Otto. Come on. Go, go, go. At the end of World War II, drug addiction in the United States has been on the rise. According to the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, there are 60,000 addicts today. Some other estimates have run considerably higher. No one really knows, for we are dealing with a hidden population, most of whose members remain underground, unless they are arrested and sent to prison. For more than 40 years now, the use of narcotics, except for strictly medical purposes, has been illegal, and the user of drugs has been a criminal almost by definition. Because the addict has lived in the shadows for so long, because he has been intimately linked with crime, and also because for many years the subject of narcotic addiction itself was considered unsuitable for general discussion, an image of the addict has arisen that can be summed up by the words dope fiend. How accurate is this image? One way of finding out is by meeting a few addicts and letting them speak for themselves. These are some of the people you will see during the next few minutes as we present excerpts from a number of filmed interviews. All of them have been addicts for at least five years, and all have served time in prison. The interviewer is a psychiatric social worker. How long were you in prison, Carol? Um, this time I was there for a year and a half. A year and a half. How about the first few days out of prison? Were you afraid of getting hooked again? Sure. Not, not really getting hooked right away, but just starting again. And we just, there's no stopping until you get caught again. And, um, it, I don't know if you, you could just meet people easily or if there were places that you could go to or people that you could talk to without having to account, you know, for time and things like that. It would be a little easier. How have you been managing financially since you were released seven weeks ago? Well, I started working uh, two days after I came home. And it was just uh, 
as a vacation replacement. Very nice job, and I liked it. And I thought I would be there permanently. Um, and my father died, and I had to give up the job. And uh, I've done, you know, a few days. And I've had some friends who have helped me. Were there any other ways you might have gotten money? Uh, well, yes, I, I could have stolen or started hustling, boosting. You did that in the past? Uh-huh. Yes. How, how come you didn't do it this time? Well, I wasn't using stuff. I wasn't, you know, desperate. I'm not that kind of desperate. Did that enter your mind? Uh, at this? Of course. It's like uh, starting all over again. And then I can't do that unless I get high. And um, then that would really be the beginning. It's, you know, I can only do one with the other. Have you ever boosted or prostituted when you weren't using drugs? No. The entire life of an addict revolves around the pursuit and consumption of drugs. He is rarely able to work, and in any event, most jobs will not pay enough to support his habit, which may range anywhere from ten to a hundred dollars a day. Some addicts were undoubtedly criminals even before using drugs. But no matter what his previous background, sooner or later the addict probably will end up obtaining his money illegally, and the amounts involved are considerable. Jimmy, how long have you been addicted to drugs? Well, steadily about 10 years. About 10 years. May I ask uh, how much your habit costs daily? On the average, about $30 a day. Uh-huh. And did you work alone? Well, uh, when I was boosting, shoplifting, I had a partner I worked with. We used to go to the stores together and uh, more or less a team. You know, we'd go to a store and... Uh, there were certain things he had to do and certain things I had to do. And was he a drug addict, too? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Did he have a habit uh, as severe as yours? Well, uh, at that time, uh, our habits rent us about $30 a day apiece. In other words, between the two of you, for drugs alone, you needed about $60 a day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much would you actually have to steal from department stores, list price, store price, to net yourself $60 a day? Oh, anywhere from 180 to around $200. $200 a day? Yeah, because uh, we'd get a third of uh, the value of uh, the merchandise. Well, in other words, this is about $1,400 a week since you use drugs every day. Yeah. Although the department stores are closed on Sundays. Uh, this is about $70,000 a year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in 10 years, it's very close to three quarters of a million dollars. Sounds like a lot, but... You figure it like that, it is. A Senate investigating committee has reported that narcotic addiction and the illicit drug traffic account for one quarter of all the nation's crime and for one half of the crime in our major cities. These are largely petty crimes, crimes against property rather than against person. Whatever else he may be and do, The addict does not conform to the popular notion of the dope fiend. Violence, sex crime, murder, these are not consistent either with his personality or with the chemical effect of the drug itself as it spreads through his body after an injection. You are at ease. The last thing you want to do is get up out of the chair you're in, so certainly you would not entertain anything that resembled anything of the violence that's attributed to us. by myself. The only thing I'll do violently when it comes to drugs is run. Either away from the police or to a connection or to a place where I can use it. That's the height of violence. Uh, to hurt people, to inflict any sort of injury on anyone other than the closest to us by depriving them of something they need materially is about the extent of it. We, we do hurt people, we punish them by punishing ourselves. But, uh, no, Mr. Connell, uh, violence is a myth. Do you sometimes fall asleep after taking a shot? It's one of the goals. It's not asleep, actually. It's what we call on the nod, which is sort of a somewhat comatose state where we are 
And that would be it. That would be the height that we could reach, or the depth. Take your choice. Uh, no, we do this to rid ourselves of all activity, spiritually, physiological, and every other way. So what would be the purpose of using drugs were it to make us stimulated? Quite the contrary. We are depressed, and that's what we seek. From the point of view of society, then, would you feel that alcohol, for example, which is quite legal, is more dangerous than heroin? And I'm speaking of violence and crimes now. Well, uh, I don't want to uh, cast any stones, but I would say that the alcoholic is... Well, put an alcoholic in the car, and he's got a 3,000-pound weapon. All the drug addict wants to do is get in a corner somewhere. He don't want to even be involved with anyone. Once he gets that shot, he is out of the way, so to speak. He is disposed of. Well, it's the same thing. It's like taking a formula. It's like just living in a crib. And when you wake up, you have a, your bottle and go back to sleep. And then maybe an hour or two, you play, which would be the equivalent of maybe going out or going to a flick or something like that. And then some more formula and some more sleep. It's just being just like a baby in a crib. It's not doing anything but just uh, sleeping and uh, gratifying yourself. Medical authorities agree that heroin, the drug used by an overwhelming majority of addicts, is a sedative that addicts themselves are mostly passive people seeking an escape from anxiety and from the problems of living. There are representatives of all social and economic groups in the addict population. However, the majority of addicts, at least of those known to the authorities, are the products of poverty and of the urban slum. One reason is that narcotics are more readily available in these areas. There was a lot of stuff around and then uh you got to figure in a neighborhood like that, uh, there's a lot of drug addicts live around there because there's a lot of furnished rooms, you know, cheap apartments. And uh, the fellas that are from the neighborhood, a lot of them will sell stuff, you know, to make money and that. There's always a lot of junk around in the neighborhood like that. That's possibly why a lot of these young kids are hooked, you know, or fool around with stuff because, uh, it's very easy to get, no problem. Availability is one element, but equally important is the fact that slum conditions create stress, making their populations more vulnerable to the appeal of a chemical escape. In my family life, I guess it was the best that they could give me, but that was very little. It was no real family life. And, well, my... Coming up was left pretty much up to me. I was left to drift in the streets and do everything the fellas in the street did. Who were your heroes when you were a teenager? They were the guys around who had the cars, always had money to spend, never had to work. My, what they did, they may have taken numbers or something like that. Or maybe they were selling the reefers. I had the after hour joints and things like that. To me, that was a big deal. And you grew up wanting the same thing. We want a Cadillac, you want to own a house. But you're not adequately prepared to do it in the right way. And so maybe you start writing numbers. Because nobody's going to have any re regard for your lack of education if you have money, in other words. And uh, so as soon as you get those things, well, that makes you a respectable person in the community. You can associate with anybody. And you can feel just as good as they feel. That's what more or less I think changed me to just, well, just got tired of just being disgusted making $45, $50 a week. Seeing fellas out there who weren't as intelligent as I was, and I mean, illiterate fellas coming up from the South or from the West or wherever they came from, and they're making $150, they are making $200 a week. And it was just, they just had a lot of things that I wanted. I mean, illegitimately. That's right. You agree? For the slum dweller in a large city, where wealth is visible but opportunities are limited, where there's a great gulf between desire and attainment, life can be discouraging.
particularly if he's a member of a minority group. What is it like knowing that uh, you're being discriminated against? Well, you, you feel as if you're powerless to do anything about it. I mean, you can strike that physically, but and if you try to go about it in, a, in an intelligent manner, it's still not accepted because you sit down and you interview me, and you'll say, yes, fine, fine, and, uh, and you shake my hand, and then you say, oh, well, I'll get in touch with you. You see? I mean, and if I, I accuse you, if I, not accuse you, but if I think that uh, you're being discriminatory, I, uh, you look at me as if I'm foolish. There's no discrimination, you tell me. Yes, maybe a white boy will walk right behind me with maybe less qualification than I do, and he'll be accepted for the job. And things like that, you can't reconcile. You see? Now, what can you do about it? Yeah, that's, that seems to me like the connection between situations and drug addiction is is that you're faced with things that you can't do anything about, and this seems to That's alleviate. Like what, right? Well, well, like you were talking about, uh, this color thing, this lack of education, this lack of money, all these things that seem like at the time, possibly, there's nothing you can do about them. And uh, for that reason, drugs do seem to soothe things anyway, at least make you better prepared to accept them. It, you can accept them in a better vein. Psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists all look upon drug addiction as a symptom of disease, of individual maladjustment, and of social and economic disorder. Yet our attitude has been to treat the problem as if it were primarily a moral one, a vice from which the addict can be broken if he is dealt with severely enough. Perhaps the clearest indication of this is the example of the addict who wants to stop using drugs, to withdraw, even if only temporarily. In the two federal narcotics hospitals, the process of readjusting the addict's body to being without drugs is accomplished under medical supervision and is relatively painless. But in the addict's home community, treatment facilities are almost non-existent. If he wants to kick his habit, the chances are he will have to apply for admission not to a hospital, but to a prison. Here, he will go through the same procedure that he would if he were charged with a crime. His name will be entered on the police record. Turn your pocket inside out. Bend over for a second. Did you have any last shot? That's mine. He will be searched. Photographed. And fingerprinted. And then he will be placed in a cell, or if he is lucky, in a ward to undergo withdrawal. This is the Manhattan House of Detention for Men, commonly known as the Tombs. This is the 12th floor where the self-committed drug addicts are kept. In the city of New York, we have no other facilities for self-committed drug addicts. This is our infirmary. It's quite limited. We have no doctors or nurses here at night. It's strictly cold turkey. I've never been a drug addict. I went through to withdrawal symptoms of cold taking, and you don't know what it's like. I've been using drugs for eight years. I kicked 12 different habits. 
Oh. That's even hard for me to put it into words. For the first day, it isn't too bad because you still have a shot in your system from the day before. But going into the second and third day when you get about 72 hours and then a real fun starts. You get the sweats, you can't lay still, you're puking. You can't keep water on your stomach. You can't keep nothing down. You're just in complete misery. It's hard to explain. And uh, you feel like you just want to throw yourself out of the and kill yourself. People have already done that too. One friend of mine hung himself. Another friend cut his wrist. It's a bad thing going through with you all said this. <sighs> Commissioner of Correction of the City of New York. And prior to that, I was judge in the criminal court for some 20 years. As a consequence, I am familiar with the problem of drug addiction, not only in New York, but all over the country. Drug addicts consume a great deal of the energies and facilities of the courts and prisons. In New York alone, a little under half of the male sentenced prisoners have a history of addiction, and more than half of the women. The addict who leaves an institution is not in an enviable position. He's probably penniless. Most employers will not hire him. Most social agencies will not handle him. Most doctors will not treat him. His family may reject him. And most respectable people will misunderstand him, fear him, and despise him. It is hardly surprising that he keeps returning to the one place where he finds acceptance and an easy solution to his problems, drugs. In spite of over 40 years of increasingly punitive measures, we're confronted today with a costly problem and a growing one. A great many solutions have been proposed, ranging from the permanent confinement of addicts to the legalization of drugs. My own belief is that there's no single magical answer. We're hardly at the point where we can think of the end. What is needed first is a beginning. As simple a thing as the creation of a climate of opinion that will encourage knowledge and research, that will enable us to accept addiction as a medical, social problem and a health problem, not simply as a criminal problem, and that will permit us to view the addict himself not as the current stereotype dope fiend, but as a sick and clothed human being.